Hello, everybody, and welcome to session 13 of our microeconomics class. We're getting near the end here. Um, and so what we're going to be doing in this session and the next couple sessions is applying the economic principles we've learned about in the past few sessions um, to real world situations um, that are kind of intractable public policy questions. Um, we'll be talking about different market failures and other failures of um, both the market and the government in serving kind of the greater public. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is one specific instance where governments can fail their citizens um, in providing providing public goods and acting as kind of the, the, the public arbiter behind the whole invisible hand system and making sure a capitalist system works. Um, and so we'll be talking about that. And then in the next session, in session 14, we'll talk about common pool resources um, and how governments and other um, institutional structures can address those issues as well. And that's how we'll close out the semester here, is looking at two specific instances of how governments um, are often insufficient in addressing um, greater societal problems. And as we'll see today, um, governments are often um, the creators of some of these um, social problems. And so that's what we'll be talking about today. Let's go ahead and switch over to the slides and we'll get started. Um, so we're talking about when governments go wrong. Um, so far throughout the semester, we've been talking about how great governments are, um, how their whole purpose is to provide public goods, they tax, um, they try to fix um, monopolies, um, they try to fix um, externalities and provide information, fix information asymmetries. Um, we have mentioned that when there is taxation, it causes deadweight loss and we don't like that because um, it makes markets less efficient. Um, but one thing we haven't really talked about is kind of connecting um, all of that economic stuff to politics and society in, as a whole. Um, which is something new that economics has been doing over the past decade or so. Um, rather than just looking at raw supply demand numbers and where things cross and, and all these numbers, um, is looking at the actual consequences of public policy um, and um, how we can make um, policies more equitable and more just and more fair. Um, especially when governments cause the inequities and the unfairness. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We have two topics that we're going to cover. Um, the first, to introduce the larger policy issue that we're going to talk about, um, is this idea of national identity and ethnic identity and this, this concept of whiteness, which is um, kind of at the foundation of uh, American public policy and American capitalism. Um, and we'll use a specific case study of one group within, within American society that was able to um, kind of earn whiteness and become part of, of larger white capitalist society as a whole. Um, and it mirrors what lots of other ethnic groups have been able to do, and it shows what other ethnic groups have not been able to do, and racial groups, um, um, because of, of really hard, um, awful racist policies that, that um, our society is premised on. So we'll, this is kind of introducing the, the larger issue here, the policy issue of um, the institutional legacies of white supremacy and slavery and how that influences our policies today. Um, and in your readings, you looked at a whole bunch of different examples um, from Sandy Darity, um, from Derek Hamilton, and from Mirsa Baradaran um, that explains different policy answers um, to these these larger issues of, of kind of the institutional legacy of slavery um, and of general white supremacy and how we can fix that um, using economics and institutional thinking. Um, so let's go ahead and start talking about identity. <laughs> 